Today I'm going to discuss the ether theory of light. By light, I'm, use, I'm using light as a generic term for photons, little bundles of electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic radiation. Uh, to, to set the stage, I'm going to assume that somehow uh, fundamental particles with the property of gravitational attraction are allowed to accumulate in a, in a huge ball. And uh, I'm going to add a, an absolute coordinate system to that, to that mass. Uh, a, a clock, an absolute clock, and I'm going to assume that some charge distribution is introduced into this mass as a, re of, as a result of which there's <coughs> a huge explosion, otherwise called the Big Bang, and, and in the process of, of this fiery explosion, the electrons and the fundamental particles uh, arrange themselves and, and get together to create the elements. Now, if, if, if there's still a... If, there's not enough electrons to, cre to, 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 to associate with all of the, uh, the fundamental particles, then you could have some masses flown out, uh, which could be considered to be uh, dark, dark masses, dark bodies. Uh, and also we have the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the laws of physics apply in particular uh, the conservation of linear and angular momentum with respect to the absolute coordinate system. Now the ether theory says that there's an invisible fluid fixed to, uh, to the absolute coordinate system A which carries light waves or photons. Now the source of the light I'm going to assume is uh, electri either electro electron orbit drops or moving charges that is relative motion or absolute motion. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little picky here because just saying it's, it's moving charges doesn't really mean very much. What, what is an electron moving with speed, speed v? Speed v with respect to what? You, it, the speed depends on the coordinate system. So that's why I made that little distinction there. Now I'm going to assume that light waves behave in ether like water waves. And the way I'm just going to say a few words about how, how water waves uh, act because I'm going to use those principles in the, in the subsequent discussion. So now if, if I imagine I, I have a lake, here's the shore, it's considered maybe the, the shore can be considered the absolute coordinate system, and I have two boats, sailboats, one, one is, is moving, there's the sail, in through the water, and the other is stationary. Now I'm going to go imagine myself in, in the moving sailboat, and I'm going to take a, a stick or a paddle reach over the side and, and, and tap the water at various places. Now what's going to happen, what, what I observe is that instead of these, these uh, circles of waterways moving along with the boat V, they're stationary with respect to the shore, no matter how fast the boat V is. And so that if the boat was stationary and I tapped the, uh, the water along, reached over and tapped the water at these different places, there would be no difference between these circles and these circles. They both would be radial, radial water waves stationary in location with respect to the shore. And they would all travel at the constant speed of water waves, which I'm calling C in this case. Now, there's also the case where water waves approach an object. In particular, I'm going to consider water waves approaching a, uh, a wall at an angle, a stationary wall at an angle. Now it's, it's pretty common and well known that, that the water waves are reflected off the wall with an angle of incidence equal to an angle of reflection and uh, the speed go uh, in and out is C in each case. Now what's a little more problematical is the case where the, the wall itself is moving with a velocity V. To, to, to think about that I'm going to imagine myself at the on the wall and uh, the, the, the water, a water wave approaching me with some, some speed less than C, and it's reasonable, I believe, to assume that from the viewpoint of someone sitting at the wall looking at a, 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 a wave approaching with some sp specific velocity, speed, that it's going to be reflected in the same way, as it, in the same manner as it is in the case of the stationary wave. That is, I'm going to make the assumption, or the new assumption, that the relative angle of incidence is equal to the relative angle of reflection when the wall is moving with respect to the incoming wave. 
And finally, using the same principle over here, I can assume that once this wave or the folk, once the wave is reflected, it's going, it's going to be reflected, it's going to move with the speed c just as it did in every other case. Now, uh, to illustrate this principle uh, uh, by a, a nice illustration, but to illustrate this principle, there, there's the, the case of skipping stones on, on, a, on a smooth lake. And you, there, there are videos on YouTube which show that. And, and there, there's some beautiful illustrations there which show the, the, the stone skipping uh, across the lake. And what's, what's, what's interesting about it is that no matter how fast that, that stone is thrown, at the point where it touches the water, there's a circular pattern that develops that moves out with respect to the point at which it touches. It doesn't, and they all maintain their, 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 their separations. And it, it's just, there's no difference than it, as if someone had gone along and just poked the, the water at those respective points. So uh, one final illustration, if you have a, 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 a puddle of water, if you, if you tap the water with your finger, you'll get a, 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 a cylindrical wave radi radiating it out from the point that you tapped it. On the other hand, if you swipe it with your finger, no matter how fast you swipe it, the result will still be the same, a stationary wave radiating from the point at which you touch the water. So with that background, now I'm going to discuss the Mitchelson-Morley experiment, whose purpose was to, deter to question the ether theory of light, Na namely, does light move with a constant velocity with respect to some invisible ether. And the, the, the assumption was that the surface of the Earth is moving with some velocity v, which is calculated with respect to, the, to a fixed coordinate system. That velocity v is calculated by astronomers. Estimate. I don't know how they did it. It's, it's, some, it's similar to the Earth rotating about the Sun has a very high speed. So that, that approximates the the, the speed of the surface of the Earth with respect to the fixed stars. But uh, again, I'm an astronomer. Now, uh, so uh, the assumption is that I have a table and uh, that is moving with speed v with respect to the f a fixed coordinate system. And, then I, and on that table, I have the Mitchelson, I have a Mitchelson interferometer, which works as follows. I have a source of light which is directed at a source of light or photons directed at a, a split beam mirror so that part of it is, direct, is reflected upward and part of it goes through and then reflected back at these mirrors creating two different paths. And the assumption was that the, the path length this way and this way, the, the path lengths were different so that the, 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 the photon stream would emerge at the detector out of phase and you would see interference rings or interference bars. <coughs> so uh, to, to analyze this now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm now going to analyze this from the, I'm going to analyze the experiment from the viewpoint of the ether theory of light and the, the assumption that it, the ether behaves, uh, waves in ether behave like waves uh, in water. So what that means is I have the, 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 the photons emerging from the source, no matter how fast they emerge with respect to the source, they travel, they travel with speed c through the ether, that is with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, absolute, with respect to an absolute coordinate system. So, which I've shown here is a. When they reach the uh, the mirror, which now is traveling at a speed v with respect to the absolute coordinate system, the assumptions from the, the water analogy come into play, namely that the, 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 the incoming beam is reflected with the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection of the outgoing beam, so that goes up at 90 degrees, and also once it's reflected, no matter what the incoming speed was, it moves through the ether with a constant speed c. And with, with that, with that, the, the path, the time for path two, three, is, is really quite simple. We have, we have a photon moving up with absolute velocity c and returning with absolute velocity c. 
so that the time for the path 2, 3, T, 2, 3 is 2, L over C. Now, path 5, 6 is a little more complicated. Path 5, now, we have uh, the photon moving at velocity or at speed C at the same time that the, uh, that the uh, interferometer is moving with a speed V with respect to the absolute coordinate system. So, uh, the total time for the photon to traverse path 5 uh, is as calculated as follows. The, the time for, for path 5 uh, for path five, all right, for path five, and the total time for path five and six is as follows. The total time of travel, time, the speed of travel C, is equal to the total distance covered. And the total distance covered is L, the distance from here to here, plus the amount that the table traveled with respect to the absolute coordinate system, which is VT. Then it turns around, then it travels another distance L, minus the amount at the end of it moved in time t. So for t5, 6, you get that t5, 6 is 2L over c. So both times are exactly the same, and you would expect no interference pattern when the two beams emerge and uh, hit the camera, or the, or the detector. So that the Mitchelson-Morley, so the results are completely consistent with the Mitchelson-Morley experiment with that there's no interference. Now, Sanyak came along, and I don't know why, he, he, he took the Mitchelson-Morley experiment uh, uh, set up, and he rotated it. And strangely enough, by doing that, he did get an interference pattern. So now I'm going to, I'm going to analyze that with the ether theory, and uh, I'm going to use the, the Sanyak ring interferometer, which is a, a little more easy, to, it, it's a little easier to, to, to think about. The, the ri Sanyak ring interferometer consists of a fiber optic cable formed into a circle and tying into a source of photons at, at, at the end. And uh, photons are, are, are fired in, in, in this in one along along the ring in one direction at, at speed c, and at the sa same time, in the other direction at speed c. Now, by the relative theory of of by the rel that the relative theory of light, sp relative theory of the speed of light, which says that the speed of light is rel is constant relative to its source, you would have that this photon <coughs> relative to, to the beginning travels that distance, and this photon relative to travels at a speed c in that distance, so that they both come together at the same time, and you would see, <coughs> you would see no uh, interference pattern. However, you do, it turns out, you do see an interference pattern, so that the relative uh, speed theory of light uh, doesn't, doesn't apply here. So, However, if you assume that the, the, the ether theory, that the speed of light, regardless of its source, is always C, a constant with respect to the ether, then you do get the results. And that, that calculation goes as follows. Uh, in, in order to follow, uh, see it a little more easily, I, I've unwound the two arms of this into a, a, a train, so to speak. And at the beginning is the center of the train, and what I have is... I have a flash of light at the, taking place, not in the train, but outside of the train, sending photons uh, at a speed c in both directions. Well, one, once that, and then the train itself is moving at a velocity v equal to r omega, and the length of each half is equal to the circumference, which is 2 pi r. Once that, that model is clear, then the results follow quite easily. I, again, I have that C times the total time of travel for uh, total time of travel for this photon to reach the end of the train is equal to the C times T1 is equal to the total travel, which is the length L plus V times T1, from which you get that T1 is L over C minus V. And for the other direction, you have that C speed of the speed of light absolute speed of light, times the total time of travel is equal to the distance covered, 
which is L minus, in the meantime, this is moved in a distance, distance V T2, so it should get T2 is L over C plus V, and then uh, T1 minus T2 and uh, the difference in the distance covered is, this, is, is the classic result that you can find all over the internet. So the, the Sagnac experiment confirms the ether theory of light and the Mitchelson-Morley experiment confirms the ether theory of light. By the original calculation on the Mitchelson-Morley interferometer, it was concluded that the ether theory was wrong and the Sagnac concluded that the ether theory was right. So the only way to resolve the, 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 the contradiction was the theory of relativity, which was used to resolve this contradiction. However, there is no contradiction. If, if you use the theory, the ether theory of light correctly and are observing that the characteristics of waves in ether as being similar to the characteristics of waves in water, you come up that the, you come with a complete agreement between Mitchelson-Morley and Sagnac, so there really is no there really is no requirement for the theory of relativity to, to resolve anything. Uh, there, there, I just I, I notice here I have a, a little sketch, a little model of, of the two different uh, appro uh, uh, approaches to this one, the relative and the, the absolute. The rel consider I have a, a, a building, and on the top of the building I have a, uh, a track, a, 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 ro a rotating restaurant with a track in it. Now, if, if I have two runners, if, if I put a mark, if I score the track with a white line, and I put a, run, a runner, two runners at that white line, and tell each of them to run around the track with the same speed, then they'll both arrive. The time it takes them to arrive at that point will be the same, no matter, no matter uh, if that's stationary or if 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 I not tell them to hang drapes over the windows and tell them to run in either either direction. With, with, the, with the track rotate, the result will be the same. The, the rotation has no bearing on, on the time it takes to go around in either direction because they're running rope with respect to the track. On the other hand, if now I take two runners and mark the starting point outside of the track and tell each, each to run in opposite directions till they get to that, the marked line on the track, then when I rotate the track, for this runner to get to the rotating mark on the track is going to take longer than for this, because he's trying to catch it, it's going to take longer than this runner running opposite to the rotation of the track because he's going to be running into it. Thank you. <laughs>